Greetings and welcome to the United Church of Clinton's time of worship. I'm Reverend Marilyn, the pastor, and I greet you in the name of peace and in the name of Christ. Today we are overjoyed to have the Reverend Kelly Gallagher join us. Hello, my name is Kelly Gallagher and I'm your Associate Conference Minister for the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. It's wonderful to be with you, the United Church of Clinton. I'm so excited to share worship with you and be with you in your coffee hour. I come bringing greetings from the 600 plus churches of the Southern New England Conference and the 88 churches of the Central Association of which you are a part. And I bring gratitude from a grateful church for all that you have done over the years to support the association and the conference. I also bring my own gratitude for your willingness to be adaptable in this difficult time and throughout the years. It's been a joy and a pleasure to work with you. So let us together join in worship. Thank you. On another note, we continue to lift up Eunice Salmon on her 100th birthday a week ago Saturday. Yay, Eunice! Our outdoor Sunday Vespers service will be held this afternoon on the side lawn at 4 o'clock. Our own Mary Ellen will lead us in this time of worship. Please bring a lawn chair and please wear a mask. Now let us prepare to worship with the ringing of the chime and the meditation of time of centering. invite you to join in this morning's call to worship and as we have done in these virtual days I will be reading both the leader and your part the people's part and you will see in a moment when it comes up on the screen you will see in the first line the word the kingdom of heaven is like that is not a typo this is to give the sense that heaven is a place where 
kin of all togetherness is. So I invite you to join and share in our call to worship this morning. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed that carries the life of a tree. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny portion of yeast that makes bread rise. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny pearl of great price that we would give all our stuff to have. The kingdom of heaven is like a fishing boat filled with catch, good and bad together with fisher folk wise to recognize the good. Our song of praise this morning is Seek Ye First, and we will sing two verses, and as usual, Alana will remind us of the melody by playing it once through for us, and then you will see the words on the screen, and we will sing together. Thank you, Alana. invite you to join me in the prayer of the day. Holy One, you call us to find your kingdom already hidden in our world, in tiny transforming possibilities, in beauty that calls us to surrender all, in complicated choices that call for wisdom. Reveal yourself here in this moment and heighten our senses that we may find you and join you in building this kingdom of love and hope and peace. In the name of the one who calls us to seek, Jesus Christ, amen. And now it is time to take a moment to think of all the folks we would like to pass the peace of Christ to this morning. And as we have done in these virtual days, I invite you to hold in your mind's eye all the people in your life, your friends, your family, your colleagues, anyone that you wish to pass the peace of Christ to today. Alana will play it once for us, and then we will sing it all together, followed immediately by the Gloria Patri. Thank you, Alana.
Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. And before I begin to share the scripture with you, I thought it might, I thought it was helpful for me, so I thought I'd share with you a context for this particular reading from the Old Testament. Um, Marilyn will talk obviously about its, its meaning, but I thought I would be the sort of the place setter. So if we think back, oh, to almost I think very early in these virtual worship days, we, um, we started off at the very beginning of Genesis with the story of creation. Since then, we have taken our scripture reading with Psalms, but also we have visited the stories in the Old Testament that tell of how God chose the Israelites to be his chosen people. And this is part of that story. As well as the story of God choosing the Israelites, the stories are also family stories of offspring, inheritances, not good moments, wonderful moments, God visiting in several forms. And so here we have another one. Now, just to set the scene, this is about Solomon. Solomon, whose name means peace, was the son of David and Bathsheba. Now David, when he was chosen by God, God initially promised David, Solomon's dad, that David would build the first temple of the Israelites. But because David, well, to put it bluntly, he let God down. So God withdrew that promise and bestowed it on his son, Solomon. And part of what we're hearing now is God acknowledging that Solomon is the chosen one. Now, the other interesting thing, as I said, that in the Old Testament, this is what I find fascinating, God will appear in all these different, different forms. Um, one of the most striking manifestations for me has always been when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. But sometimes God spoke using messengers, angels, voices, etc. In this reading, God is going to talk to Solomon in a dream. And this is where our scripture reading of this morning begins. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father, David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. This is Solomon referring to himself. And now, O Lord my God, you have made me your servant, king, in place of my father, David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. So God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but 
have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has come before you and no one like you shall arise after you. And this is the ending of our scripture reading for the first part of worship. And now let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. In today's reading from 1 Kings, the Holy One asks Solomon, newly come to the throne, to ask for any gift. Solomon ponders and asks for the gift that will enable him to serve the people of God best an understanding heart to know good from evil and to lead the people in wisdom. There are other responsible gifts that Solomon could have chosen, reasonable gifts, but he put the needs of the people at the center of his desire. Let's take a moment in silence to consider our lives, the many competing needs that confront us. Let us pray. Let's ask for the discernment and wisdom that Solomon longed for, that our choices may reflect generosity and the common good. Amen. Holy One, your word gives light and understanding to all. We open ourselves to prayer and find you already in our hearts, leading us in the way of justice, compassion, and peace, calling us to find you in our neighbor's need as well. Thanks be to God. A message for all God's people. If someone offered you to give you anything you wanted, what would it be? Think about that for a moment. I want people both young and old to think about that and come up with an answer. What would you want if you were offered anything at all? In our Bible story, story this morning, Solomon loved the Lord and even hung out with the priests where he worshipped before he built the temple. God appeared to Solomon in a dream and offered him anything he wished. And what do you think Solomon wished for? Remember, he could have anything that he wanted. Solomon asked for wisdom, to make good decisions. What? He could have had anything. But wisdom to make good decisions is what Solomon asked for. I admire Solomon for that. He was a person of good character. He was wise and God gives Solomon all the things he didn't ask for. Wisdom, respect, greatness, and long life. Let us be in a spirit of wisdom this day. Amen. Our second song this morning is Cry of My Heart, and we will sing a refrain, a verse, a refrain, a verse, and then end with the refrain. But first of all, Elana will remind us of how the refrain goes, and one verse, 
and then we will start that sequence together. So, cry of my heart. Thank you, Alana. <laughs> prayer. Gracious God, so often we forget to praise you for all you have given us. The psalmist encourages us to give you thanks, to sing our praises, to tell of your wonderful works, and to seek your strength and presence continually. We confess that we are more likely to find the negative things around us, especially in the middle of a pandemic and raising awareness about racism. Forgive us when we turn away from you and that which you are calling us to embrace. Help us to walk with you, trusting your guidance and direction for our lives. We glorify your holy name we give thanks to you for the many opportunities we have to make a difference in our world because you are with us on this journey. Amen. A reading from Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33. It goes like this. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds. She worked that flour until it worked all through and became dough. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When our nine-year-old asks for something, they often say, I need whatever. I need to play with my friends, or I need to use your iPad, or I need ice cream. To which I often reply, need is a big word. <laughs> I'm usually gifted with a roll of the eyes and a dramatic, fine, I want whatever it is. This has been exchange of hours over the years, and it is happening less and less as Cordy starts to distinguish the difference between a need and a want. 
so much so that I've actually heard Cordy say to a younger friend or to a classmate, need is a big word. Interestingly to me, God does not distinguish for Solomon what he can ask for, a need or a want. God simply says, ask what it is you would have me give you. God does not say, what do you need or what do you want? Solomon has to decide for himself. And it appears that he can ask for anything at all. It is God, after all. Now, in his response, Solomon shares with God and the reader a process that I think we would do well to emulate. Solomon does not leap to whatever might be his first instinct, nor does he focus on tangible, measurable outcomes. Solomon enters first into gratitude, and then awe, and then humility, before even attempting to consider what he might ask of God. This moment defines his future, this answer to the question. And we all know that the wisdom of Solomon is a touchstone not only for the church, but also for the secular world. Now Solomon lived in a world that was just as conflicted and at war as we are today. In the preceding chapter, King David lays out while he's on his deathbed, all the enemies that Solomon was to deal with to avenge David. And within that chapter, Solomon does a fair bit of avenging and killing before this conversation with God. So God rightfully anticipates a request of power, money or long life or the death to his enemies. Wants, if you will. In fact, the scripture suggests that God was expecting Solomon to ask for these human motivated things. God was pleased, the scripture says, and I want to suggest perhaps a little surprised at Solomon's request. God, give me what I need to do the work that you have set before me, what I need to do it well. Give me understanding and discernment to seek your justice for these people and this world. What would it be like if humanity used Solomon's decision-making process before determining what we want or even need? What would it be like if we first acknowledged, like Solomon, the gift of all that we have? Oh God, Solomon says, what great and steadfast love you have shown to my father David in so many ways. And now here am I, his son, to sit on his throne as a sign of all that you have given him. What would it be like as a nation, as a world, even just as a people of faith or individuals, before we decided what we need we first acknowledged all that we have in gratitude. And then after overflowing gratitude, Solomon acknowledges in awe the work before him, the people that God has created. And in awe does not claim power over them or ownership of them. These are your people, O oh God, a great a numerous body, beloved and honored by you. What would it be like if we made every choice and decision about others with the awe that Solomon shows for the people of Israel? People, I want to add, known to be difficult, hard-hearted and stiff-necked, the Bible says. They anger God and do dumb things, honestly. Perfect? No awesome? Yes. Can we, like Solomon, see others as God's people? Before we make decisions or speak our minds, before we judge or oppress or jail or withhold, can we see God's people and be awed by them? And finally, Solomon, in all his glory, as Jesus says, 
comes to his decision with humility. I am but a child who knows not how to come in or go out, he says. Though if you read the chapter before this, he's already done a fair bit of policy and war work. He's 20, by the way. Most 20-year-olds would not say they are children, particularly those given, literally, the keys to the kingdom. I know I wouldn't have confessed to being a child at the age of 20. What would it be like if we, in all our glory, could still acknowledge in humility that we don't have all the answers, we don't know everything, and in fact, our opinions are just that, ours, not God's. What would it be like? Perhaps we might leave room to change if things don't seem to be working, or if they even just seem to need to move on. Because we could acknowledge our own fallibility without fear of retribution or ridicule or loss. Perhaps we could be less defensive and arrogant and less sure. Perhaps that would be okay. Solomon understood that the work he was called to do was God's work and needed God's guidance and wisdom. As people of faith, it is important for us to remember the same. As followers of Jesus, we too have acknowledged that our lives are both gifts and tools given by God and calling us to bring the good news of God's love and mercy and justice to the world. We do not live in a world that necessarily honors these things, these things of awe and humility and gratitude. Gratitude for what we already have, all for the people of this world, and humility in any form. So often our world and culture affirms aggressive responses to conflict, reacts out of anger and fear, operates from a place of scarcity and not abundance. We have moved so far away from awe of God's people that it has been okay as a nation to keep children in cages, separated and isolated from their families. We are so far from gratitude for what we have that we continue to accumulate more and more while simultaneously feeling deprived and left behind. And we're so far from humility that indeed it is something to be disdained. And yet the good news is that we are a people of faith. We know another way. We are Christians and followers of Jesus. We believe in a God of love, a God of mercy and of hope, a God who can take the tiniest thing, the tiniest act, the smallest mustard seed of intention and grow it into a movement of hope and justice. We have a responsibility, like Solomon, to seek with intention God's clarity and discernment and understanding. We, as people of faith, are called to ask of God a discerning mind, a discerning heart, not of this world. Every time we have decisions to make, as communities of faith, with decisions of how to spend our money, whether to regather in a pandemic, where should our voice and our mission be directed? We are called to pray to God with gratitude, awe, and humility for an understanding heart and discerning mind that considers all of God's people in our decisions. Everything we do is preceded by a decision. Every word, every act, every prayer, every vote. May all of those decisions be preceded by gratitude, awe, and humility. May it be so. 
Amen. In our invitation for the offering this morning, our God calls us to seek and find the hints of the kingdom in our world and to nurture its growth among us. We will use our gifts, tithes, and offerings to rebuild the body of Christ. And now let us pray. O oh God, grow these gifts in your love. Bless our offerings, our hearts, and our hopes in your love to make us worthy of your work for your kingdom in heaven and among us here even now. Fill these gifts and each of us with your goodness. Amen. Our last song of the worship service this morning is Standing on the Promises. And this is remembering the promises that we have been given um, through Jesus and also hearkening back to the promises that God made throughout the Old Testament. So here is the circle closing. Uh, we will sing two verses, Alana, will remind us of the melody before we begin to sing Standing on the Promises of God. Thank you, Alana. Oh 
forth in wisdom, in hope and courage, with hearts open to recognize the signs of the reign of God in our midst, and courage to create more space for grace in our lives and in our world. Amen.